Hello everyone and welcome to Mind the Gap from Hornby here. During the pandemic, uh, being a um, part of the hobby industry, it was clear to see that hobbies in general, um, not just model railways, but board games, fitness, sports, um, gaming, all these sorts of things, they, they, they helped us through a very tough time, a time where we were struggling with being isolated, with not seeing um, our friends and our family, and having that release, having that focus, I think it really, really does help. I think it's fair to say that this past year or so has been a challenge for all of us. But one of the good things to come from it has been to see how many people have started taking an interest in model railways and have also returned to the hobby after a bit of a break. For some people, it is just a fun way to pass the time, a bit of a hobby. For others, it's a way to escape the real world for a bit and a chance to create your own. And in my personal opinion, building a model railway is something that everyone can enjoy. Not just for yourself, you can actually take it to, I don't know, uh, railway events, model railway events. That I, I really want to do that in the future. And you can bring people together. That's what I love about uh, the model railway. Well, not just the model railway, but like in, in the train lovers world. I mean, you can you can do anything with other people you can build your own railway for using model railway uh, equipment certainly at times like we've just endured lockdown it's been essential to me and it's been essential that we have the likes of Hornby the wise modeler exploits what he or she can get the best from Do you like trains? Are you like me that can't get enough about trains? Are you a fan of Hornby? And do you buy Hornby magazines? Then you have come to the right person because me, Oliver Smith, YouTuber LazyJet, is going to tell you why you should love Hornby and why you should like trains. And this video is going to help you feel confident of liking trains because when I was at school, when I was very young, I got bullied a lot for liking trains. People thought it was a weird thing to like. And it's still be going on that people get bullied at school for liking trains. So in this video, I'm going to make you feel very confident of why you should never be ashamed of liking trains. So I, Oliver Smith, is going to tell you a story of where it all began, how I like trains, why I like model railways, and why I like going to visit uh, Heritage Railway Lines. So, sit back, enjoy the video, and let's get into it. Yeah! So why do I like trains? When I was a young boy, I always loved trains. I always had the uh, old-fashioned documentaries. I always had the original Thomas and Friends books. I even had season one of Thomas and Friends on videotape, which doesn't exist anymore because you can't get videotapes. And when I was a little boy, I didn't know steam trains still existed. So my dad took me to the Watercrest Line, the Midhance Railway, and for the first time ever, I saw a real life living active steam engine. And the very first steam engine I ever saw was Bodmin, and Bodmin is very special to me because as I said, it was the very first active steam engine I ever saw because I thought steam engines didn't exist anymore. So the fact that I saw an active steam engine, I was like, I was, I was in shock and I, I was such a happy boy on that day. And that's when I fell in love with steam engines and not just steam engines, but like with other trains as well. So I think being a train enthusiast is probably like one of the best things you can be. And then one day on Christmas Day, I remember running down the stairs and seeing a big box. Now, what's in that box, do you think? Have a guess. What do you think was in that box? You've guessed it. It was my very own first ever train set. Now, I think my very first train set was the A4 Peregrine, but although I could be wrong, I could have had one before, I'm not sure, but, you know, my mind isn't really what it used to be. But uh, I remember having my very own train set for the first time, and I just fell in love with, the with like, the Hornby train sets and the, the, the model railway world. I, I just wanted to expand my collection and, like, collect some amazing um, model railway stuff. I've gone through my locomotive collection and I've picked out five of the Hornby models which for me uh, they're, they're just favourites that persist. Um, some of them are newer than others uh, and one in particular goes right back to when I got back into railway modelling um, straight after university. Um, I'd gone through some fairly dark depressive times and um, that was when I, I first found the love of building model railways to help me through that period. And the first locomotive actually that I bought was a Hornby uh, X Lancashire and Yorkshire Pug. It was number 51222 
and um, it was it just I just remember seeing it in a model shop window and falling in love with it and I went into that model shop and it was right at the time that um, I was working uh, in uh, broadcasting uh, I got a, a good well-paying job out of university and I suddenly realized that I didn't have to ask permission to buy things um, and I went into that shop and I bought that locomotive um, and uh, I've I've still got it it's still cherished it's in my collection it's now been DCC fitted and in fact I love those X L and Y pugs so much that um, I've made it my mission to buy every BR running number that's been released and I've got a few others as well beside um, but certainly um, I, I still list this as being one of my favorite locomotives of all time. The next locomotive I've chosen is uh, Walter K. Wiggum, which is an A4 Pacific. And um, for me, this locomotive, it's the experimental purple livery, which really attracted me to it. Now, A4 Pacifics have been a firm favorite ever since my childhood. And I can still remember the Christmas, uh, probably about 1984, when a second-hand Hornby 00 Silver King arrived um, and it was the first tender steam locomotive that I ever owned um, and I loved that locomotive and I still actually have that locomotive it's uh, in a, a display cabinet now um, but I think that's what kindled my love of A4 Pacifics and this particular one in its very eye-catching livery was one that stood out enough for me that I, I knew I had to have it in my collection. Hello and welcome to the Hornby Magazine Workshop. You join us here with our double O gauge layout top of the which is just behind me here. And uh, well, a space which allows us to uh, enjoy model railways in a, a number of different ways. It does. Uh, it's always that, it's that happy place, isn't it, that we can go to. Yes, definitely. Well, we're always making something. We're always, well, there's always something to run as well. Yeah. Uh, we've got the new samples that come in here. We test them on the layout here. Uh, and every now and again, we actually, we, we get together and we have a, a running session with the three of us where we'll enjoy the layout, not as a work thing, but actually just for our own entertainment as well. Yeah, it's good just to let off steam, literally, um, on the layout. And right. um, sort of immerse yourself in the operation of steam trains, models, diesels. Anything and everything, really, that we can get around here. That's right. Well, it's like for yourself, for example, you haven't got your own model out there, have you? So no. it's a good place to come and actually no. get to, to use the model as you bought. I've got a well. test test length, which I can make sure that things work on. Yeah. Um, and I can sort of run things round, but nothing in a circle. So it's just sort of a little end to end yeah, more than anything. We've got a reasonable size. Reasonable size here, here. Get up to a fair lick of speed as well. Yeah. Yeah, so I suppose we should tell you a little bit about Toffeydale as well, just so you've got a bit of an idea of, of what we actually have in terms of the workshop here as well. So this, this is, it probably looks quite high, because um, it is it is 1.4 metres off the ground as a layout, uh, but that's because it's got other layouts underneath it as well. So it's got different scales underneath it, including I've got a garden railway, which runs out of here into the garden as well. Uh, but Toffeydale itself is 16 foot long, so the full length of it from one end to the other, and it's also 10 foot wide as well. So it's quite a sizable model railway, a typical kind of size. You might find a, a loft or someone's garage as well. On that we've got um, a number of features actually because we've got the double track main line that goes all the way around the main circuit of the layout. Mm. There's then a secondary double track main line which branches off at the, uh, the junction there and allows you to have diversions of trains going on a different route as well. So it actually gives it pretty much four sides of scenery with it. Um, but it's also over the back as well, behind the rear part of the scenery, it's got ten tracks for storage of trains as well. So we have a number of trains set up on the layout. That's great when you're able to have a, a running session, just be able to come back and kick back and relax and just watch some trains go by. As well as remembering the point numbers and the signal numbers and which route does what. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the bits that I know. It's no always a challenge, but yeah. it's good fun. Yeah. So yeah, because everything on the layout is DCC controlled. Uh, so the points, the signals, the trains, everything's operated from a DCC handset. Uh, which works fine in this kind of environment where you're at home because you haven't got to worry about the pace of delivery of trains. It's a little bit different when we're at an exhibition because you want to be able to deliver the trains in, in a much more speedy fashion so the public can enjoy yeah. them. Yeah, so. when you're at an exhibition you've got to remember every single train that's on your track, yeah. the code number yeah. for each and every one of them, yeah. and the individual nuances between how the DCC chip is set up, whether it's got braking on F2 or whether it's a whistle and all those different things. or. Yeah. Again, that's what's what, what and where, for, isn't it? <laughs> so it's always good fun just yeah. to sort of test it, and then if we can't work out what's what, we shout for you. Yeah. So obviously, the, the, the today's event is all 
about mental health and, and well-being and things. Um, and we kind of briefly had a chat kind of off, off camera. Um, and we were talking about anxiety, which is something that I'm sure a lot of people at home experience on various different levels. I know myself, I, I experience it a lot. Do you, do you find that something that, that, that you it's, deal with? It's one of these things that sort of sneaks upon you when you don't think about it. And uh, the strangest times, really. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I went up Snowdon, and I haven't done Snowdon for climbed a mountain for you know a few years with COVID and yeah. Uh, and a couple of times, you know, uh, I got to places where you know a bit of exposure, a bit of uh, and all of a sudden you think, can I do this still? Am I still? You know, last time I went up, I was I was I got uh, I got a chest infection. I wasn't well. Not, oh wow! And I was proper ill, uh, but I didn't know I was ill. Uh, so it was a proper struggle. So to all of a sudden, you know, to find myself back on a mountain on the same route that I did last time, which I really struggled with, uh, it took a bit of sort of, uh, you know, talking to yourself, saying, look, you can do this, you've got it. Uh, it be quite easy to sort of turn around and sort of stop and go go back down again. But yeah. It's, uh, you, you know, it's a bit of mental... Uh, well, that's it, isn't it? Confidence, really, just to think, yeah, I can do this. And I suppose the same with modelling, really. It's just uh, there's times when you think I can't, you know, I can't do it. This is this is above my skill level. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes you just need to stop and take stock, look at what you've done before. Yeah. And go, yep, yeah, I can do it. Uh, and again, sometimes when you've got friends around you, you know, clubs or. Especially if you work in you know, these sort of environments, you know, Hornby, there's plenty of people that can support yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's something I've noticed a lot about, you know, talking to people for this event is how beneficial the social side of things is and that not everyone is a, a social creature, so to speak, in, in the traditional terms. Yeah. But being around people that share your interests um, and that have a common love of something is is quite um, quite something. I mean, I've got um, friends. I'm I'm a avid fan of uh, professional wrestling, the American okay. style, and I've got friends, and we you know we've bonded over that, and we've we you know it's something you can always talk about, and it's something that other people maybe don't particularly have an interest in, so it's kind of niche in that sense. Yeah, and I think. You, as someone who, who experiences anxiety in, in the sense of that there's nothing necessarily causing the anxiety as such, you know, I'm not anxious about doing something much like you were saying, you, you're anxious about going up, but mine tends to be just that's that feeling of yeah. anxiety, I suppose, as if something bad's going to happen or something like that. And I'm very much a, a doer someone that likes to, to just get on do things if I if I sat and think too much then then that's where things crop up for me and I think having done this job now for four and a half years and having spoken to people modeling hobbies in general are exactly that you're doing something and you're kind of I don't want to say tricking your brain because that's kind of diminishes it but just diverting it a little bit yeah. So that you get a bit of perspective, it's and then your body just like kind of yeah, and your body kind of settles down. You go, okay, no, it's okay, it's fine. You know, you can do this. You have done this, you know, this climb before, or this part of your hobby, or whatever. And yeah, the, the old adage of you're your, your own worst enemy sometimes can be Absolutely. very, very true. You know, it's uh, the problem is with uh, like mental health issues. There's not. It's not obvious to other people, uh, no. and people don't. Only you know what you're going through, yeah. Uh, and it's something you need to, you know. Like I said, talking is a great. Way yeah, definitely. To, uh, and, and it's good that it's now sort of. Uh, it's more of a, again. I don't. I don't need to say I'm wrong, but like a mainstream thing now, where people are talking about it. Yeah. Uh, it's not sort of. Uh, it's not as taboo. Uh, no, now, is it's it? not sort of the old. You know, lock away, lock, lock, lock you away in a padded cell, and uh, or don't, or don't or, talk about or, it. Yeah, yeah. About yeah. It. It's, you know, it's that sort of. Uh, I think because 
the the world in general is such a different place to even 10 years ago you know things like um we've mentioned it a few times in the various different things we've had for the event but social media is is almost the the elephant in the room really because <clears throat> it has a lot to answer for for people thinking um less of themselves like self-esteem higher kind of um holding themselves accountable for a lot more you know yeah image everything from yeah image to you know even with modeling you might see someone's layout that they've done wow i could, I could never do that you know but they're not going to put up on their social media well, the exactly times wrong. they went yeah that went wrong or the you know the things that, it's the same with I love films, um, and I've I've done my own films. I've worked on my own films, and n at the end of the day, no one sees the final. You know, you you, you no one's seen the eight want. cuts of I don't know of the Godfather before, where there was problems with it and it didn't quite work right. They just see the final product, and that's yeah. that's what they want you to see. And and I think social media tends to be exactly that, and a, a very edited version of life. Good morning or good afternoon depending when you're watching this. Uh, here I am uh, with somebody who actually needs no introduction but just in case we have somebody from Mars. This is Pete Waterman, uh, well no, uh, sorry, Pete Waterman OBE. All right, OBE. Well, let's not get into the titles. No, right? no, uh, but where credit's due. Uh, anyway, uh, he's come down to Margate. Um, we're here for a chat, and um, I'm really anxious to know how um, the Chester event went, and um, really how it all started, Pete. Well, I mean, uh, surprised, yeah. uh, presently surprised, because I think when you and I last talked about this, it was two years ago now, Yeah. and um, the idea of having a, a layout in a cathedral was, uh, you know, it was a, a, a bit of a, a different angle, um, but we both thought it was a great idea. Mm. Um, I don't think we realised just, I mean, it was like we've opened a bottle and the gene has popped out. You know, we had 65,000 visitors and we raised over 135,000 for the cathedral. Um, and you've got to remember this was still under COVID rules. Mm. So we still had to wear masks up for the very first part of this exhibition. Um, we were meant to social distance, uh, and for the first week, we did that. Uh, we believed because we, we you know, I've been doing shows since the sixties, so I thought I knew what a model railway show <laughs> was supposed to do. Um, but we chucked out all the rules. We took all the barriers away, so right. there were no barriers. There was just a silk rope. And so there's nothing really stopping you getting to the layout. We didn't think people would want to watch the, the fiddle yard. Well, more people, you know, as many people watch the fiddle yard as watch the front. Yeah, right. So it, that, that was a, an education. Because you're in the cathedral, there are, there are a lot of rules when it, it comes to, like, what you can do. Mm -hmm. um, not... Sound wise, because we, you know, that that wasn't a problem because the organ drowned out what we were doing <laughs> anyway. Um, but you know, you have to go through all the checks, um, so we had to be very careful with children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we worked a way getting around it, and we soon had the kids behind the, you know, with their parents working the layout, and uh, you know, it's out of the mouth of babes comes that you, you get to go right. Ah, oh, right. I, I see it now because we forget. As, as model railway fanatics, especially someone that's been doing it since, like me since the 50s, you forget we see it different. Yeah, we no, yeah. You do. We see it different. Yeah, I agree. And suddenly when you're confronted with a, an audience that's not traditionally model railway people, yeah. they see it very differently. Yeah, they do. And, and we picked it up very quick. All they want to do is see trains doing 90 miles an hour, Correct. flying around every two minutes, in fact, two minutes is too long. They want them every 10 <laughs> seconds. Uh, and that, I, you know, for us, was the most enjoyable part. Mm. Because suddenly when you're taken away, you're trying to run a timetable, because that was, we never envisaged running a timetable anyway, because, we, you know, this is a 64-foot 
long rail, you know, you've got to... And you've got to have movement. You've got to yeah, have you've got to have movement. Yeah. Uh, and, and so we knew that we couldn't work a timetable, but we didn't quite envisage, in, you know, that 15 seconds between trains was too long. You know, I mean, that, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, you, you, you forget it. But in the end, it worked for us because we had lots of volunteer, um, co you know, controllers. It really hadn't weren't model railway enthusiasts. So literally, the, you know, when one train came in, you said as soon as you, you park that, you get the next one out. Right. So in other words, you, all you do is change the point there and off you go. And once you've emptied that lot of trains, you put them in the next road. And then when that's empty, you just so all you do is just run as many trains as you yeah, want to run. No, exactly. Uh, it keeps yeah. it simple. Yeah. I know when we, we do shows, one of the biggest thrills I get, the enjoyment, I suppose, is what you were saying. You get the youngsters who come in yeah. and they look. Now, they, we see a locomotive that big. They see it that big yeah. and it's massive and they're right up and they're living it. And it's the excitement on, and, and the sheer joy on their face. I think uh, that's, that's what does get me every time. One thing that, that, that worked for us, and I'd love to say I was clever enough to think this before, but I, <laughs> I'm not clever enough to thought. But I did insist that we had a tunnel in the middle of the layout. Because yeah. it's 65 foot long, 64 feet, I knew that we had to break it. Because if you look down 64 foot of railway track, it's a long, long way. I mean, you really don't appreciate it until you, until you stand there. So I, I'd worked out that we needed a tunnel in the middle, which we built North Church Tunnel, which is just outside Burkhamstead. So you couldn't see all the way down. What I didn't realise, of course, was we actually had three tunnels, right? right. So the kids could see them moving around the back, yeah. but they couldn't see which tunnel it was going to come out of. And of course, that was really exciting for because they were running up and down, going, "Is that this tunnel? No, it's coming out!" <laughs> and it would shoot, shoot over. It would come across the viaduct, and, and we, we went, "Ah, I got it. Okay." So it's the surprise element yeah. that was that, that was really sort of that kept them excited and kept them really interested. Yeah. Also, it, it um, what was it really relevant? Because we didn't choose a time period. You, we could run anything. That was the whole point. Mm. Just run trains. You know, whether mm. they be network rail trains, whether they be Avanti, whether they be steam engines, doesn't matter. We can run anything on here. Right. Time is, 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 is open to us. The layout's today, but we can use Jeremy's special run up and down with steam engines on. We can use historic diesels. Um, but when we ran the Avanti trains, uh, and the Virgin trains, the kids really loved them. Because, of course, they know them. Yeah, of course. They see them. And particularly because we were running scale tree, trains at scale speeds, yeah. They could relate to them, you know. And they've all got lights and they've got sound and they're colourful. They're colourful, yeah. 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 So it was um So, so But yeah. let me just say one, yeah, one cool. thing that, that that we were all skeptical about. This layout is sixty four feet long, sixty five uh, back, twelve feet at two ends. So it's a right. long layout. Yeah, yeah. It's a scale mile. The front is one scale mile. Mm, right. Right? So if you're on the fast lines, the up and down fast you're going around eight times per hour one train goes around eight times per hour right. if you're on the slow lines they go around slightly less because there were more trains yeah. on the slow lines so the pendolino was doing 0.7 of a real mile every single day along with the hst and the advanced passenger train they were doing 0.7 a mile every single day six days a week so the record was the Pendolino that we worked out had done between 52 to 53 real miles really? by the end of the exhibition. We cleaned the wheels twice, mm -hmm. and we cleaned the wheels on the HS uh, on the APT about three times. Right. The HST we didn't even touch. We never cleaned it. Interesting. And it ne we never had a problem. It never stopped. We didn't clean the track every day. It just went round and round and round and. and that was the thing that staggered us, all experienced modelers. We all expected, and we had spare locos, to swap just in case, they, mm. and not one of them faltered. No, that is, that, that is good, good to hear. But that, again, that's a credit to the engineers we have and, and yeah. the manufacturing. Yeah. And <clears throat> to be honest, and I would say this, we avoid cutting corners. And it's ever so easy to cut corners, but, you know, the name over the door is Hornby, and I think people look for 
reliability. I mean, we've we, we've got a heritage, and we need to keep that. Yeah. And uh, but that, that all the same, it is is good to hear. Well, the co the comments from the older audience, who put their granddads, if you like, yeah. and their grandmothers, was by God, our trains didn't run like this thirty <laughs> years ago. Of course <coughs> they didn't. No. And and it's technology has yeah, moved on, yeah. and you know, particularly the granddads were fascinated by the technology we were mm. using. Mm. You know, we told them they were all running scale speeds and they couldn't work out. We explained to them how you, we programmed the chips down because we had a miles to measure them over. So it was like, um, you got a double whammy. You got the granddads who got the, the old Hornby three yeah. rail up in the loft, yeah. were dying to get home to set it up. And, <laughs> and I'm saying, guys, don't expect them to run <laughs> quite like this. <laughs> this, is a, this is a slightly different technology. Cool. Thank you to you at home for watching, for, for eight hours um, you know you never know if it's just going to be me talking to a camera on my own but I really appreciate you all being here and chatting in the in the uh, the live chat so thank you for that and of course to all the amazing donators that have that have donated today because ultimately that's that's what it means you know it's about donating it's about helping people um, and doing something for people and I think it's humbling to me that you um that you've given in a time like this where maybe you can't um so i do appreciate it and we have made over two thousand pounds today in eight hours which is more than i ever thought we would have done uh, today which is a huge achievement uh, for everyone so i hope you've all had fun um aside from all the technical difficulties and things like that um i think you've you've really made a difference um and um, ultimately fun is what it's all about. It's all about enjoying life. So well-being is exactly that. Finding things that allow us to switch off de-stress and hobbies of all kinds help us do that. Uh, whether it's model railways, plastic kits, gaming, sports, films, or even just socializing, you know, down at a friend's house or a barbecue, things like that. The things that we certainly missed um, during 2020 and into 2021. Times have been hard uh, and there'll be moments that come and go that, that will be just as hard um, for individuals and everyone. Um, so finding that way to relax, to just take a moment and forget troubles for a while, we'll all be better for it. If you would like any more advice, you can visit the MIND website where you'll be able to find out all the information. Uh, we'll be sharing highlights from today's events uh, in the coming weeks. So do come back and watch those. I'd ask you again, if you, if you can, please donate to our Just Giving page. It really does help. And of course, you might win one of those amazing bundles, which includes so many different things that, that I know I'd love. Um, thank you again for all the donations. Uh, and we will leave you the way that we started with some more information about Mind and the amazing things they do. Thank you. I'm Mike. This is Mind the Gap. You've been great. And I'll see you at the next stop. There are a number of misconceptions surrounding mental health. There's an enormous stigma. Britain is a, is a country, perhaps more than any other, where you might say that the national emotion is embarrassment. And nowhere is that clearer than when it comes to issues of mental health. We're addressing a real crisis. One in four people in any given year suffer from a mental health condition. The greatest cause of death amongst men under the age of 35 is suicide. My first overdose was in 2003, December. I felt I had no future. I couldn't hold down work. I genuinely believed that the people around me, for all the hurt I was causing them, would be better off if I wasn't there. Bipolar changed my personality uh, by making me the person that I didn't ever want to be. I was very, very low. My self-confidence, self-esteem and self-worth went. I just felt very sort of isolated and I felt like I couldn't talk to friends and family because I couldn't really express what was going on. I knew there was something wrong, but I couldn't put it into words how I felt. When I was in hospital, physical restraint would happen quite regularly to me. Uh, I spent most of the 90s, which was my 20s, in and out of hospital with five really serious admissions. It was just an unimaginably fearful experience. And I felt quite scared, isolated, not having many people to turn to.
someone mentioned mine to me. I went down one evening and I was fortunate that one of the staff there was able to spend some time with me. He just reassured me that what I was living through was perfectly normal. I began to develop relationships and friendships with people who I could actually speak openly with about my mental illness. People who, as I put it, they got it. My first experience of mind was through a recovery centre in Hackney called Irie Mind. Just went there and it was fantastic staff, uh, discussion groups, our empathy, compassion is at the forefront of their organisation. They really do help help people and they care as well and it's very, very obvious that they're there because they want to help people, not just because it's their job. There's something really extraordinary about the MIND network and the, the work we do with people with lived experience of mental health problems. Sometimes people come to us because they need our help and support, but as they receive that help and support, they often then become part of our movement for change. I got in touch with the media team and they asked me if I would like to be involved in a couple of the projects. Over the last couple of years we've been campaigning on the issue of restraint, which is when somebody's being held down against their will. Gary was very involved in the campaign from the start and he really helped to bring the campaign to life by sharing his very traumatic experiences so that people could understand what it feels like to be restrained. Just sharing that lived experience, which is so important. A lot of the experiences, once you talk about them, I'm sure it does take away a lot of the fear and uh, normalises it a bit. Because Solent Mind um, have helped me, I want to give back and help others because of the fantastic work they did with me. They started coming up with different ideas that I could do, and one of them was to start um, going into colleges. My name's Avi, and I'm from the mental health charity Solent Mind, and we raise awareness and understanding of mental health in a project that I run called Heads Up, which is for young people, and just to get an understanding of what mental health is and how important it is to talk about mental health. I thought, you know what, I'm going to raise some money for MIND because I'd never forgotten the impact that MIND had had on my life. I'm now currently approaching the end of 12 months of fundraising for MIND. It was the most amazing experience of my life, running the Virgin Money London Marathon for MIND. The crowds were absolutely fantastic. MIND constantly say that no one should live with a mental illness alone and that's my mission, to help them to achieve that and help others in the same way that they helped me those years. We are MIND and we are working together to make a huge difference for now and the future.